great American heavyweight. Here's how our conversation went. All right, time for us to turn our attention to the murky world of uh, high quality, as in world championship level chess. I'm delighted to say one of our favorite contributors, Bryn Jonathan Butler, is with us. Bryn, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, there's two reasons to have you on. Obviously, Deontay Wilder is going to fight this weekend. We'll talk to you about that in a couple of minutes' time. But uh, who knew that the uh, crossover between the world of uh, high-level chess and boxing was actually so pronounced that um, the, the mental aspect of this game uh, can ruin people in the same way that boxing does? I think obsession in any real arena of ambition, but it seems especially chess and, and others that aren't as well compensated financially uh yeah can lead to some pretty dark places what was it that drew you first to I said, there's two reasons we want to talk to you one the ongoing situation at the moment with the um the world championships but what drew you to actually end up writing a book about it an editor found me in this case which is very unusual uh, a publisher had had read a lot of i think i've always been drawn to lives of the extremes and chess has a lot of characters throughout its illustrious history um Chess was invented the same century that toilet paper was, and still it has this sort of peculiar allure about what it, what are the skills involved in chess and how are they transferable to other things. Um, so there's just a lot of, uh, I actually found a lot of crossover in the characters of boxing and chess. For example? Well, you, you take, I mean, Bobby Fischer in his heyday was bigger news than the Watergate scandal and the Vietnam War. Uh, Walter Cronkite would say, we'll get to those, but first let's talk about Bobby Fischer playing in Iceland. And so I, I, I just, I found that he was a character that couldn't have been born anywhere else but America in the same way that you have a lot of heavyweight champions that feel the same way. Uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, Mike Tyson. Um, so I was very curious that in 1500 years, chess has always struggled to find an audience in many ways, a mainstream audience, um, especially when you're having, as you're seeing in the World Chess Championship, 12 draws in a row is a hard sell to an American audience. Um, it's always been the characters that have really drawn people in. And unfortunately, a lot of their genius walks hand in hand with, with some eccentricity, shall we say, with the rest of their lives. I'd say in terms of Fisher and kind of the eccentric behavior that came after his, his uh, chess heyday, um, this wasn't a standalone kind of um, experience that he had. Uh, this was a bit of a trend that you found in the book. I think there's a real continuum of, of great champions, especially American champions, where, yeah, you find them, a lot of, a lot of them were institutionalized, uh, a lot of early identified prodigies, who either succeeded at fulfilling their potential or failed, met a similar fate of, of just really struggling. Uh, I think there's a kind of darkness at the heart of chess if you're willing to give yourself for 14 hours a day. I mean, you can't get to this level that Magnus Carlsen is without sacrificing your entire childhood. And people forget that, I mean, these people are like Glenn Gould at the piano in terms of their investment. And is there kind of a bit of a chicken and egg situation here in terms of whether kind of people who might experience these uh, struggles are drawn to chess or whether it might trigger things? Like, is there any actual kind of scientific research on that link? I did interview some neuroscientists to discuss it, and, and some of that is up for grabs. But, yeah, just, just I think when you're having a first glance at the li illustrious list of the greatest players to see... Uh, a Paul Morphy, who was Bobby Fischer in the 19th century, die surrounded by women's shoes in his bathtub, or um, players convinced that they were playing God on a on a radio, um, and and a lot of them being institutionalized. And I'm speaking strictly to at the highest level. I'm not saying kids who pick up the chessboard are going to be led to some horrible place. It's a it's a proven great learning tool in many ways. I mean. If we look at uh, acting at the highest level or music or, you know, or sports, I mean, there's many examples of people who self-destruct in order to get to the highest um, arenas. Uh, I just think that we, we often confuse people who are extraordinarily accomplished that it's their virtues that led them there as opposed to demons that drove them. And I think chess, chess bears that out more than, than some other areas. Did you find that when you went to 
um, cover the the Magnus Carlsen World Championship. Did you find that this was something that was going to be a story that resonated beyond that subculture that exists at the moment? That it has crossover appeal in a similar way. I mean, I, I, you know, so many we spend our life making these reductionist comparisons to uh, the popularity of sports at, at their heyday: boxing, racing chess in this instance, but is there a crossover appeal beyond the subgenre of people who actually really like it for somebody like Magnus Carlsen? I think it's struggling to find it and, and part of what was fun to report on it was the horrendously misguided way that the, the organizers were trying to advertise it. Um, for example, at the 2018 World Championships, you see on the side of the table, the world is watching a quote taken oddly from the 1968 Chicago convention where there were riots, the Democratic convention. Um, and as I'm watching the official FIDE feed of the game, the world is watching. There are 4,000 people that are identified as watching. I mean, that is, is a very commonplace thing with chess where um, uh, the advertisers that you're seeing a loop of while you're there is like a Russian fertilizer company. So I don't necessarily think Rus like Russian fertilizer as I'm watching chess. Um, and it felt very much almost like a, a kind of cross-section of, of coming back from Atlantic City after a boxing match, being at a, a Greyhound bus station to come home at 3 o'clock in the morning, and then the audience from a Russian oligarch illegal art collection. So it was a very strange intersection of people um, to, to, to be around, as boxing is very frequently. I mean, uh, Pacquiao Mayweather had the most celebrity star power that I've ever, I, that I can conceive has ever been assembled for anything. It was all of music, all of politi American politics, sports, uh, film, and Donald Trump is there. I mean, it was incredible. So I think, I think with chess, there are some big names that are interested uh, several billionaires were coming to the event, but it's still seen as a little bit nerdy. It's still struggling to find its way, and I think it's trying to compare itself to say, more people do this than tennis or poker. Can't we be just as financially viable? But if you, if you or I competed in America at the U.S. championships and we came in 12th, we would make $5,000. That's what you make here for that, that kind of esteemed title. So it tells you in terms of the, the financial viability of the sport, it's not, it's not really professional in that way. It's more of a charity for billionaires to keep it afloat. And speaking of Russian fertilizer, um, the championship that you <laughs> focus on in the book, um, that was actually happening in New York against the backdrop of Trump being elected. And what was that experience like? Oh, it was like a, a, a collective nervous breakdown in New York. Uh, I think 70 to 80 percent of people here voted for Hillary Clinton and they were in shock. And um, I think the best metaphor I came up for in the book was it was like the Titanic hitting the glacier. And the only place in the city where people weren't talking about what do we do next was being in the games room, which is where, where the Fulton market felt like watching chess. Um, everybody was just concerned, oh, Magnus Carlsen, is, is, is he the greatest player ever? And amidst, uh, not quite rioting outside, but uh, not far off, I mean, literally there were Trump pinatas being beaten, there were American flags that were set on fire. It was a, a very bizarre, very sad scene. There were a lot of people in tears riding the subway days after the election. Um, there, was, there was just a real sense of how did this happen? Like, I guess because New York more intimately than the rest of the country has, has been so close to Trump and his exploits, there was just a lot of disbelief and, and sadness. So, uh, and, and I was trying to figure it out too. I mean, I don't think very many people saw Trump coming and we had a Russian challenger where Putin had actually bankrolled him to come from Crimea to Moscow and was sending in high level officials to watch <laughs> Uh, somebody who is representative of, of all the values of, of kind of Putin's Russia. So it was, it was a, a weird redux of sort of the Cold War backdrop with Bobby Fischer and Boris Spassky. And so is Carlson the greatest ever player? Is that just a question that's thrown out there with a bit of hyperbole attached to try and 
um, ignite some interest, or is he genuinely as good as any of those greats? Well, he has the highest rating ever, but you could look at Bobby Fischer and make an argument and say the distance between him and the next best player is the widest there's ever been in chess history. Um, you could look at the ways in which Fischer was able to be as accomplished as he was, was demonstrating big victories consistently. And Carlson, we're seeing some struggle with, um, especially in this championship, he offered a draw in the 12th game of the championship and it sort of offended the whole chess world about is, is this in keeping with being the greatest ever. Um, so there, there's some debate about it. Um, he's certainly an absolutely extraordinary player who's been world champion for five years. He's still a very young man, but we're going to see, I mean, if he loses in this overtime as it heads toward Armageddon, as the chess world says, um, I think he's going to define his legacy in big ways. Well, you mentioned the five grand if you're like 12th in the USA championships. Is Magnus Carlsen rich beyond the wildest dreams of a child setting out with a chessboard? Well, he's certainly making seven figures with advertising. Um, it, it's a million pounds to, to it, that's divided by the winner and loser of the world championship. And he's, this is his third. So he's, he's doing very well by chess standards. But to put it in perspective a little bit, if it was $5 million that was used to organize the world championship in New York, and that would be about eight seats at Pacquiao Mayweather. So yeah, fair enough. where is it relative to other things? Not, it's not anywhere close to professional sports, but... I wouldn't mind making the kind of money that Magnus Carlsen is on the chessboard and also he's doing some advertising and some modeling and that kind of thing. So he's doing very well by chess standards. But uh, a refrain that I heard from many chess players, uh, including grandmasters, was that while 600 million people might play the game, only about 30 players can actually make a living exclusively playing. And and those aren't very heartening figures for the ecosystem of the game. No, for sure. Um, the ecosystem of heavyweight boxing at the moment is about as healthy as it's been um, really since the Klitschko's came to power. This fight this weekend where Deontay Wilder is going to take on Tyson Fury, you spent some time in the Wilder camp. What was that like? What is the level of expectation? What is he specifically training for? And what does he see as the, the threat that Tyson Fury is going to bring this week? Well, the first question I asked Deontay Wilder is, are you, if, if you're successful against Fury and get successful against Joshua, let's say you knock them both out in the first round, are you the last great American heavyweight? Because who comes after you? There's not really anybody else out there. And watching him spar, he has a, an assistant trainer named Mark Breland, who was an Olympic welterweight world champion and also became a professional world champion. And I asked Breland when he put on his first pair of gloves and he said, eight years old. And I said, okay, Deontay Wilder put on his first pair of gloves at 19, very late for a boxer. Whereabouts is he at in his skill level relative to you, Mark Breland, as a welterweight? And he thought about it and got this sort of wry, almost embarrassed smile and said, probably 11. So it tells you a lot about where the heavyweight division is now or perhaps where it's always been in terms of skill. Anthony Joshua is the same, right, though? He was very late to the game as well. So there's a, there's a, a, a belief out there that potentially what's going to happen is that um, the best high school athletes who try and make it as basketballers or as tight ends in football, they get to a certain point and they realize they're not going to make the pro career. But actually, big-time professional boxing, you know, a bit of a bit of showmanship, a bit of razzmatazz, and a few tomato cans and away you go. Well, it's certainly been that way for Deontay Wilder. Um, when, you wa when I watch him shadow box, I've been around a lot of elite level champions. It is startling how basic he is um, in terms of skill level. And he also doesn't look like a boxer. His build is that of a wide receiver or, or a basketball player. Um, but he has this right hand that is almost otherworldly in its speed, in its menace, and its impact. It's extraordinary. So uh, there were a lot of journalists from England who were over there um, to, to examine Wilder up close. And what we all concluded at the same time almost watching him spar, and I thought he lost most of the rounds that he sparred against his three sparring partners, by the way, um, 
was that if he's unable to knock out Fury, this could very easily be a 12 round to nothing shutout for Fury outboxing him, just boxing circles around him. But then again, this could very easily be a first round knockout for, for Wilder. And that itself makes it intrinsically an interesting fight. And Wilder, a very interesting proposition because stylistically, it's very hard to solve somebody who really hasn't figured out themselves. And Wilder's, Wilder's style is just land a right hand. There's really nothing beyond it, which is, I, I've never seen anything like it up close in, in a, uh, an elite fighter's camp. And despite his record on his show reel, um, one of the kind of rods that's been used to kind of hit him in these parts of the world is the fact that he's not really a draw. Uh, if he did get past Fury this weekend, and if that fight with uh, Anthony Joshua did come together, you spoke about Mayweather Pacquiao earlier and sort of the scale that was on. Like, is would Joshua against Water be a fight that you could see really taking light and capturing the imagination, or is it kind of just its own niche at this point? Well, I think the big struggle is is that we're we're in a time right now where boxing is so viable and exploding in popularity, mainstream popularity, just not in the United States very much. HBO, after 45 years, has pulled out of boxing completely. Um, it's extraordinary, especially when you're seeing all of these other ventures to zone ESPN plus a lot, I mean, billions of dollars being invested in boxing because they're seeing its viability to an audience. They just want to move away from the pay-per-view model, which has made extraordinary amounts of money for very few people, but really cut off that sort of TV visibility that boxing used to have in America. So you have somebody like Joshua who hasn't even needed to fight in the United States. We haven't seen that really in the modern era. Every, every major fighter had to come to the U.S. to make their mint. And Joshua doesn't have to at all. He can sell 90,000 seats fighting you or me and make 10 to 15 million. So it's Wilder, I think, who has to come to him. Um, but there's all these problems politically as far as who their promoters are. So it's just a question of can they make it work? And I think boxing has been defined largely in the last 20 years by the fights it was unable to make when it should have made it, as opposed to the great fights it did make. So I hope it can get out of its own way and make some of these fights because they're, they're all interesting on paper. Uh, I think Fury, what he's done to come back, and, and he's such a great character at selling his fights, um, I hope that this generates an audience, but the question is, will it? Is it viable? And you're absolutely right. Wilder has never proven himself to be a very uh, popular fighter. His career earnings are less than what Mike Tyson earned in 90 seconds fighting Michael Spinks. So it puts it a bit in perspective. I didn't realize that they were so low. Where, where is the actual fight in the States? It's pay-per-view on BT Sport here. Where, where do people in the States watch it and what kind of price is it? Uh, it'll be in Los Angeles, and uh, I, th I think it's it's a pretty high price. It's certainly not Pacquiao Mayweather, but yeah, they're going to give it a try in Los Angeles. Um, I think at this point, Joshua, I mean, will he come to Las Vegas? He hasn't yet. He's never fought in the United States. So I think Wilder, Wilder's still only, this fight is going to be very important to Wilder in terms of his own financial projections, because if he looks bad or he loses, he, his entire career is going to be dismissed as somebody who was largely protected and didn't have skills. If he performs extraordinarily well, he has a lot more leverage going forward to fight Joshua. So I think it's, it's all for him to win or lose on this, but it's a big risk. Fury is a big risk for Wilder, no if, question. If Fury wins, does his past, do his past achievements suddenly catapult him into the American boxing consciousness in a way that maybe it wasn't there before? I think he's a tough sell. I mean, he's he's just unfortunately not a great American style fighter. I mean, he's an awkward fighter and he's gigantic and he's a great character. Um, it's possible that he'd be able to sell himself. I don't have the sense that this fight has really resonated outside of boxing junkies so far. It, it doesn't feel that way. I, I don't see I don't see that on social media. But but the numbers won't lie. Ultimately, it's can he sell tickets? Can he put um, people in seats? Um, so I've heard a lot of wild, wildly different projections about how successful people are anticipating this fight being. My sense is it probably won't be because I don't think Wilder has ever demonstrated that he brings a big audience. So a lot of it will be on Fury and, and sort of what's, what's elicited from the fight in terms of quality of competition. Um, 
Certainly, if Fury was able to knock out Wilder, I think we have a very different story. But I think the odds currently are 6-1 to one that that happens, and I might place them a lot higher than that. If he's able to put a performance like he did against Klitschko, I, I, wouldn't, I, I think he stands a very good chance of not just winning, but possibly knocking out somebody like Wilder. Um, Wilder's been dropped twice. He was dropped early in his career against an absolute nobody. Um, but Wilder's also very determined. Uh, Wilder had two other jobs after he turned professional. <laughs> He's a hard, hard worker. And I was very impressed by what I saw um, in terms of his character when I met him. Um, there were signs in the gym. There was one just before he fought for the heavyweight championship that said, and the next heavyweight champion. And when he came back to the gym after winning, he crossed it out and said, the new heavyweight champion. There were fun little things like that that... Uh, it, it reminded me a little bit of being in Wildcard Gym where Pacquiao made it so famous with Freddie Roach. That was a bit of the dynamic between JDs and Deontay Wilder. So that impressed me. Freddie, of course, in the corner now for um, Tyson Fury with Andy Lee in during the week. And he was making the point that um, Tyson Fury got in touch with Andy to ask him to come and just be a part of the, the camp, like as a, an advisor, or just to add a bit of boxing craft because he's got a, a relatively inexperienced coach and now all of a sudden uh, Freddie Roach is in his corner it's like well well, that's an interesting little injection of character into uh, exactly what's going on as a subplot everything I heard from the British press in Alabama was that Tyson Fury is looking very very good and he's taking this very seriously lost well over a hundred pounds I, I hope I hope he can deliver. I think he's a, I think he's a great character. I mean, he's a fast, fascinating story. Um, but yeah, everything I was hearing from people watching him was he was impressive. I think the world of Freddie. Uh, I, I owe a career in journalism to Freddie Roach, giving me Mike Tyson's phone number. That's how I started. So I'm uh, a big supporter of him and what he can do. Um, but you know, Fury Fury has nothing to lose at this point. Uh, I think Wilder has a lot to lose. I think Wilder's life is changing pretty dramatically, but could get derailed very easily by Fury. By you know, that's what's exciting about this game. You're one punch away from a completely different life, or having no life at all. In some cases, this is a very dangerous game. Friend Jonathan Butler, always great to have you on the show. Thanks a million. Enjoy the fight this weekend. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And the book, of course, again, is called The Grandmaster.